more than a decade ago, Chris Rock, our famous American comedian, reminded us that the world had gone crazy. What did he mean by that? He said that the best rapper in the country was a white guy, the best golfer in the country was a black guy, the tallest guy in the NBA was Chinese, the French were calling the Americans arrogant, and the Germans didn't want to go to war. That certainly was an upside down world as far as we were concerned from a long time ago. Two important international events shook the world last year, the COVID-19 pandemic and the global drive for equality and gender equity. Jennifer Jones, member of the Rotary Club of Windsor Roseland, Ontario, Canada, will become Rotary International's president for 22-23, a groundbreaking selection that will make her the first woman to hold that office in the service organization's 115 year existence. How crazy is that? Jennifer is the founder and president of Media Street Productions Incorporated, a 25 year old award-winning media company in Windsor, Ontario. Jennifer also has strengthened Rotary's reach and impact through her service in many roles, including as trustee of the Rotary Foundation, Rotary International Vice President and Co-Chair of the End Polio Now Make History Today campaign. As a professional communicator, Jennifer also used her vocational strength to chair the advisory group that crafted Rotary's rebranding effort. She has received many honors and recognitions, including Rotary Service Above Self Award and the Citation for Meritorious Service. Think about this. Only 2% of American CEOs were women some years ago. Today, even today, 37 out of 100 Fortune 500 company CEOs are women. But the tide has turned. What about Jennifer would surprise you, fellow Rotarians? While attending university for a degree in communications, she worked full-time in radio at AM 800 CKLW. This is the station that launched all of the Motown greats, including Michael Jackson and the Jackson Five, Stevie Wonder, Diana Ross, and so many more. She began, as she says in her words, the world's worst overnight disc jockey, and then transferred quickly into the newsroom where she found her passion. She has said that she loves being an anchor and reporter and breaking news as it happened. These were formative years for Jennifer, and the most profound lesson she learned was about the power of storytelling. This is a skill that she uses daily in sharing her rotary experience with others. Without further ado, I am absolutely thrilled to introduce you to Jennifer Jones, president of Rotary International in 2223. Welcome. Thank you, Gita. Thank you so much for the very, uh, very kind introduction. And hello, Chesapeake Pets Presidents Elect. It is uh, a delight to be able to spend this Saturday morning with you. And first and foremost, let me thank you. Thank you for stepping forward to lead your Rotary Clubs in the upcoming year. It is one of the best jobs in Rotary and maybe job is not the right, the right way to say it. It's one of the best things that you can do in Rotary. And I loved being a Rotary Club president so very much. As a matter of fact, I loved being president so much that I had a hard time sitting down at the end of the year because the whole ability to orchestrate the meeting and to raise up my fellow Rotarians and to be able to dream and take people along for that 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 ride together was something that was was something that I don't know it just profoundly um, helped to shape the rest of, of my life and and so I'm so excited that you have the opportunity for this journey I know for some of you it might be a second or a third time and for all of you it's in a very different time a different time than you signed up for when you were first selected to execute this role but we have learned very quickly that our ability to adapt, our fourth pillar in our strategic priorities, 
is one that has become our guiding star, our ability to um, use the 2020 word of pivot. We all want to get rid of that word, don't we? Let's burn all those 2020 words sometime in a big fire pile, uh, pivot, unprecedented, you know, you know the rest of them. But we've been able to take a look at our meetings and do them in different ways. And I think quite candidly, our organization has become stronger because of our ability to adapt. I think we've all talked about wanting to do things a little bit more virtually for some time, whether it's with training or whether it's um, maybe our, our meeting schedule. There's a couple meetings in person, a couple meetings virtually. But we, I don't think we were brave enough um, to take that step. And it took a global pandemic to, to quite candidly move our cheese. And it has moved it obviously quite profoundly. But on a Saturday morning, You've been able to walk into your kitchen and pour a cup of coffee or a cup of tea or a glass of water, uh, walk into perhaps your living room or your, your home office and, and get onto a call where you can be joined with people from all parts of your district. And then I can join you from another, another country um, and another uh, part, of, part of the world as well, coming to you from Windsor, Ontario. I would very much like that we could all be together in person, but there is something to be said about the intimacy of this kind of communication. And it is something that I wanna talk a little bit about um, as we start this uh, session this morning, is, is what kind of thinking goes into making a good meeting in a, virtual, in a virtual sense. I think we've all gotten a lot better at it, but as you step into the shoes as club president, it's something that you need to be mindful of and, and thinking of. And not necessarily the technology part of it. Um, that's that's a, a part unto itself. And if that's not your strength, then there's others in your club who can help you uh, with this. Um, but the messaging and the preparation part, it doesn't matter whether you're in person, which hopefully um, for a vast majority of the, the term that you serve, you'll be able to be in, in, in person with your members. Um, for a portion of it though, uh, you may not be, or you may choose to select this kind of virtual connectivity. It gives us a lot of opportunity to broaden the scope of who we attract to our club meetings. I, I, I hope that many of you have had the opportunity over the past year to travel to various parts of the Rotary world to participate in other meetings and other districts and other clubs and see what they're talking about and understand that being a Rotarian uniquely provides each and every one of us with a global passport. We are, very, we are very fortunate that we transit borders and boundaries without an official passport because we are an organization that is global. More than 1.2 million members that are Rotarians, hundreds of thousands of Rotaractors, hundreds of thousands of Interactors, and then many other program participants, alumni, partners. We're more like a two million person engine. And I think that when we look at the breadth and scope of what we're able to accomplish as this assembly, um, it really is quite incredible. So today is dedicated toward your thinking um, and continued preparation for being a club president. Now, as I say, hopefully most of the year is going to be able to be in person, but I want you to think about what is the best format for your club. I'm gonna use the hypothetical of a typical lunch club that meets every four weeks um, or every, every week of, of a given month. And that's the example um, of my home club. And trying to attract people to our club has been sometimes challenging because carving out a two hour window in the course of, of, a, of a day is, is hard for, for working professionals. We realize that a lot of clubs have tried to shorten and compress meeting times. But I'd like to challenge you to think of perhaps a different kind of model. I think that there's an opportunity for clubs to, to, to maybe think outside of the boundaries of what we've normally done, to take that box and not just, you know, to think outside the box, but maybe break the box and then put it back together in the way that it's going to work best for you. Because if you told me that a club met twice a month in person, had a typical normal meeting that we, that we would normally think of, met once to do a service project in person together in your community, and perhaps once in the month to get together purely for fellowship and friendship, 
perhaps at a member's house or a local a local restaurant or or pub would that be a good club absolutely we know that we join the research tells us we join and we stay because of service and because of friendship and fellowship we can sit through any kind of rotary club meeting good or bad when we when we're with the people that we love to be with and so much of that happens outside the walls or outside of the bells if you will of a regular meeting space. And so doing things a little bit differently. Um, we've, we've talked about flexibility for a long time, but this has given us so much more permission to step full throttle into what this world looks like. Now, there's a few things that I wanna be able to share with you today, some reflections, um, in particular, some where we're at in current moment uh, in, in Rotary, but I also want to be able to transit into a, a question and answer time to be able to hear from you and the kinds of things that you think would be helpful that perhaps I might be able to provide some insight into, or again, things uh, that are happening in Rotary that perhaps I haven't touched on. So please be prepared to think of what it is that you might want to, to, uh, to hear about or to understand. Your governors elect have worked so hard on putting together this PETS so that you have the opportunity to spend time, particularly when you get into your district sessions, to be able to share thoughts and to share ideas of what is working best. Now, I wanna tell you, one of the things that we've been struggling with, particularly in North America, has been membership. Now, not membership from the perspective of attraction. We do a really good job globally at bringing people into Rotary. What we have a hard time with is this back door. People come in the front door, but they leave out of the back door um, at a fairly rapid pace, sometimes within one to two years. Think of your own club. I know we all have examples of it. So what can we do? What can you and I do as leaders in our organization to try and stop this backdoor problem that we have? So I heard, a, I heard an idea fairly recently, and I think it's a brilliant one, and I want to share it with you because I think it's something worthy of being implemented in clubs across the globe. We have focused a lot of attention and energy over the years of asking people to do an exit interview, asking people when they leave, why? You know what? That's too late. We're not going to bring them back at that point. Instead of spending this time on asking people why they've left our club, let's perhaps instead ask them in an entrance interview, why do you want to be part of our club? And then help deliver on the promise of what they've asked for. Personal growth and leadership development is the hallmark of what we provide to our members. We bring leaders in and we make them better leaders. That is what we do. And so when someone says that they want to get better at perhaps event planning, or they'd like to maybe understand board governance better, they'd like to strengthen their leadership skills, they'd like to be a better public speaker. I think that we need to listen to that and then help them develop what it is that they've asked for. It's pretty simple when you think about it. And that's why when someone suggested this, for me, it was a light bulb moment. It was a yes. That's exactly what we need to do. And if we can deliver on that promise and people feel rewarded and heard, they're going to feel a stronger connection to their own involvement in our clubs. So while it's not a formal process, I challenge you all to think about how you might incorporate that into your own clubs and what that might mean um, for new members coming in. What has been remarkable to me is how many club meetings I've attended, even just last night, where five members are being inducted, 10 members are being inducted. I think right now, as I said at the beginning, we perhaps have never been stronger than we are now. We've lost members who have not wanted to participate in a virtual capacity, and that's unfortunate. But we've also found a lot of people who understand that they need something more meaningful in their life than simply going to work and coming home that the, the camaraderie, the fellowship, the sense, of the, the sense of unity that we have been able to provide this year in a time when we have gone through literally our darkest days. This has been a platform of hope for so many people to be in shared experience with each other. 
And I think that when, when I say that we might, might be and may be stronger than we ever have been before, I believe that when we return to, well, we, we're not going to return to where we were. Um, and I don't even want to use the words new normal. There is going to be a, a different way of, of doing business when we come out of all of this. But people are still going to need to be together. And I think that the clubs who have been able to, to, to galvanize in this kind of way have become stronger. They've been able to adapt. And as we take those lessons into our, our future uh, club meetings, we have shown that even in the darkest of days, we have still been able to perform service globally at a level that has been unprecedented. When we first went into global lockdown, many of you may recall that we, we initiated and activated our, our disaster response fund. And through that and through Rotary Global Grants, we were able to put more than $30 million onto the front line globally for PPE and for ventilators and for food scarcity issues. Well, that is 30 million that we technically know went through the Rotary Foundation. But you and I both know that our clubs all raised lots of different kinds of money through virtual fundraisers or even just simply collecting from friends and neighbors and taking care of our own communities. When we look at what that amplifies, that's hundreds of millions of dollars around the world. Um, I dare say, I, I, I couldn't even fathom how much money it is that we have put in, not only of funds, but of our own personal resource of time and making sure that, that the, the folks down the road or our neighbors or our club members have all been taken care of. Food scarcity issues aren't something that, uh, that we just look towards developing nations. We know that this is something that has been critical in our own backyards as well. My youngest brother, Dave, and his wife, Stacy, they run the Rotary Club about a half an hour from my house, and their club actually took over their food bank during the, uh, the pandemic, and they've been running it ever since, and I believe will probably continue to run it. Uh, it had been run by a group of seniors who were not able to adjust and adapt um, for their own safety reasons, primarily. And this younger group of, of Rotarians were able to say, we're going to take it over and we're going to run with it they adapted their club. Now, let me tell you a little bit about their club because I think that they're a fascinating model. My brother and sister-in-law are in their mid forties. And when I had talked with them about starting a Rotary Club many years back, the, the, the thing I heard from them the most was, you know, we have a young family, we're busy, we're working, we don't have time. You've all heard these, these, these excuses, correct? And so I never pushed. Um, I knew that at the time when it was right for them, that they would find their way. And so we attended an event um, internationally together and it was, a really, it was a really cool event. And when we came home, my sister-in-law had a, had a chance to talk with a number of different people there. And uh, she was really compelled by how many people were doing things in their communities and in different parts of the globe. And she had been exposed to this through you know, our own family interaction with Rotary. But at that point in time, she stood back and said, I have to do this. You know, what have I been waiting for? And so what they did was they took the opportunity to form a different kind of club. And so instead of it being the traditional one that they had been exposed to, they invited their friends um, all in the same age group, all in their sort of mid to late 30s, early 40s at that time with their children and their kids. They come to the club meetings with them. You know, a year ago, before we all went into lockdown, my, my nine-year-old niece, Olivia, would say to my, my uh, brother on Tuesdays, Dad, it's Rotary night tonight, right? And they'd all get into the car and drive to Rotary. And the kids would be the ones who would recite the four-way test at the beginning of the meeting. And then they'd go over and do arts and crafts or play or whatever it was. But you know what? They were always listening. And a few months later, there was one day that we were all at our family cottage and Olivia, my nine-year-old niece, came out and her and her, her friend had made bracelets that said end polio now on them. And they were going to sell them for a dollar each to raise money for polio. No one had ever asked them to do that, but they were listening. They heard what was going on. And so sometimes, you know, when they have a guest in their club, when they were able to meet in person, um, they'd explain to them in advance, there may be a kid doing a handstand in the corner and somebody might be running around, but that's what works for us. And they've been able to create, create an incredible um, new style of club that works for them. And they've been able to grow and flourish 
and it just brings my heart incredible joy. So thinking differently, that breaking the box and putting it back together is something that you have the opportunity as a club president elect right now to think about. These are important things to be able to think about. Now, back to um, COVID for just a moment. I wanna share with you what we're doing as an organization because I think it's important for all of us collectively to understand Rotary's role in, in what we um, can do as Rotarians as we um, help to end the pandemic that we have all faced. One of the things that we did uh, late last year, end of November, early December, was formed, uh, we formed a task force of the highest uh, leaders in our organization. And so our President uh, Holger from Germany, President elect Shaker, who you'll be hearing from from India, and myself on the RI side, and then on the Rotary Foundation side of leadership, our chair, uh, uh, Ravi Ravindran, uh, trustee chair from Sri Lanka, the chair elect John Germ from Chattanooga, Tennessee, and the chair nominee um, from Australia, Ian Risley, along with a few other members of our secretariat and then some special advisors. We've been meeting every two weeks to get updates from real, um, in real time from experts, finding out exactly what's going on at varying different parts of the world in order to construct Rotary's response and what it is that we can do. And it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a bit of a, a challenging uh, space to navigate because when we started all of this, of course, everyone were you know, all isolated in our own homes trying to put together a, a global response. There's some really interesting steps that we've been able to take and, and step forward. One, first and foremost, and this is a story I hope that you'll share with the Rotarians in your club, clubs, because I believe this is something that we should celebrate is that more than 30 years ago, as you well know, in our efforts to eradicate polio, we, along with our partners in the Global Polio Eradication Initiative, formed a public health infrastructure to tackle polio eradication, Polio Plus. And we all know that that plus part has been additional diseases um, outside of, of the polio window that we've been able to incorporate into our efforts. And so in more than 70 countries, um, we have been able to provide frontline immunization and care and surveillance, uh, most importantly, uh, for polio eradication. Now, when the pandemic uh, struck, we had to stop and take a pause on polio immunizations. But what we didn't have to do was pause on surveillance and contact tracing. And not only were we able to do that for polio, we were able to add COVID. And so the relevancy of our organization right now is so completely brilliant. We already understand immunizations better than any other organization. And so now working with our partners in UNICEF who help us to do much of that frontline work, the thousands and thousands of workers who are out there uh, doing that are going to be on the front lines in particular with the COVAX vaccines, uh, the COVAX movement um, into countries where uh, in particular, uh, we, we see that vaccines are not uh, readily available yet. And so this movement is going to help to make sure that we have fair and equitable distribution of vaccines around the world. And that's an important part of the voice that we all have, being able to advocate for fair and equitable distribution and to be able to address vaccine hesitancy with our friends and neighbors. Vaccines have been our space forever. We know them, we trust them, we understand that they work. And so at a time in our, our global history where um, there is vaccine hesitancy, Rotarians know best that this is something that works. And so being able to share with your friends and neighbors when you are able to get your immunization and that it's safe is something that's going to help the rest of the world um, as we move out of this collectively together. And so um, one of the larger parts of our, of our task force work is also advocacy to governments. And so talking with uh, leaders, not only at the, 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 the highest level of government, but also as leaders in our own organization, in our own communities, to talk with our municipal leaders, our regional leaders, to say, what help do you need? And we've seen incredible examples in the UK of Rotarian, uh, Rotary clubs providing the logistical support for different uh, immunization and vaccination camps. In India, we've seen the entire country uh, create the, the, a rotary infrastructure that uh, has leadership every single level down so that they have a strategy in getting immunizations to every man, woman, and child in their country. Now, they're able to do this much faster than many others because 
polio is so close to their history and they still immunize um, and we still immunize hundreds of millions of children every year because until we're certified as a world, as a global world, as wild polio virus free, um, we still need to immunize more than 400 million children a year. And that's what takes such a Herculean effort for us to be able to do that. But India will be a best practice for us to be able to look toward in terms of what they've done and what they've been able to accomplish. And it's been nothing short of miraculous. So in terms of what this means to you and I, it means we can use our own voice in our own communities to say, how can we help? And it's so much broader than just what our own governments, yours and uh, mine in Canada and the United States are able to do. There's, there's so much logistics work that needs to be provided as well. We don't have a, we've never had a roadmap for doing something like this. And so I see that Rotary Clubs across North America have risen up and taken on the charge of, of helping and aiding. And to those of you who are already doing this, um, a sincere thanks for your efforts, your incredible efforts and what you've been able to do. Now, let me switch gears because there's a few other things I'd like to quickly um, capture before we move into our question and answer period, and uh, two in particular, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and also the environment. Two last things, and then from there, I, I'm going to turn it back over to Gita so we can get into more of a, of a dialogue together, if you will. Diversity, equity, and inclusion is something that um, is not new to our organization. Diversity has been one of our core values, one of our five core values for, for as long as I think all of us can remember. And it is important that we look around our clubs to see diverse perspective, that we're a good reflection of our communities, um, both in age and gender and sex and race and culture. There, there's a myriad of ways that we look at diversity. And as Rotary Clubs, we value and we cherish this. We also knew that we needed to take it a step further. And so a year and a half ago, the board adopted a diversity, equity, and inclusion statement for our organization, making sure and ensuring that we all make sure that this is a priority, um, raising and elevating our the, the water level on how we treat this and how we think about it. This is an important thing for, I think, all Rotary Clubs and Rotary Districts to be able to reflect better upon, to make sure that, that we are that best representation of our communities. And perhaps where we aren't, that we're uniquely poised as a non-religious and non-political organization to sometimes host some of the challenging conversations maybe that we have to have in order to be better at having balance and, 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 and better diversity in each of our clubs. We've also formed a task force, a diversity, equity, and inclusion task force that's chaired by our incoming vice president, Valerie Wafer from Canada. And she has assembled a group of Rotarians from across the globe. And right now what they're doing is working um, on a, a large research project to better see what the, the world looks like from a diversity um, perspective within our organization. And then to help that inform them on how to create a toolbox, if you will, of things that we can put into the hands of Rotary Clubs and Rotary Districts that can help us maybe have some of these challenging conversations and to help maybe create better diversity, equity, and inclusion in our clubs. So stay tuned for more information about that. There'll be uh, lots coming through the pipeline and it is something that I will place some special emphasis on in particular in uh, the year 22-23. But I know this is something already happening in districts uh, and clubs around the world. And so I, I think that we are leading the way culturally as an organization for those around us to see how we can all be the best of ourselves. The last thing that I did want to mention is the environment. This is another reason, um, again, in the, in the dark days that we've been through, we, we, we have hope on the horizon, not only through vaccines um, and being able to, uh, to be together, hopefully in, in person in, in, in short order, um, but we have other good things that have happened and the environment is one. We are adopting, we have adopted the environment as a seventh area of focus for our organization and we will launch that officially on the first day of your leadership as club president. The environment becomes our seventh area of focus on July 1. And we have officially started fund development for that through the creation of an endowment fund to fund specifically projects uh, around the environment. But we also know that uh, in the year last year, when we were going through the exercise of de determining, uh, while I was still sitting on the trustees, we were determining, do we want this to be an add-on to the six areas of focus that, that we already have? Or do we want to uh, 
um, perhaps have it as a standalone area of focus. So we did a lot of research. And part of that was actually analyzing the, the year before the, the prior year's global grants. And what we were able to see was that over $18 million of those grants had application towards something that touched on the environment. So Rotarians, you already told us the environment was important. And so we listened. And so making it a seventh area of focus um, is something that I believe is going to be a, a fundamental, uh, I don't wanna say a game changer, but a fundamental improvement for us as an organization. Uh, particularly, I think that um, with the, the youth movement that is, is gaining so much momentum through Interact and Rotaract in our, in our, uh, in our Rotary world, that this is something that that really resonates quite profoundly with them. It resonates with all of us, but I think that uh, we all know that we don't have a planet B, we only have a planet A and we need to treat her well. And I think that this is something that uh, it is, a, is a, an opportunity for us to think about how we can do this, how our clubs, what, what special initiatives can our own clubs do? And they don't have to be mammoth, they don't have to be huge, they can be simple things like, you know, a, a roadside cleanup, a river cleanup, um, different things like that, collecting plastics, uh, making sure that they get into the right areas of landfills, different things like this that can happen that, you know, just one person um, can, can come up with an idea, as we know, uh, just like polio, and it can amplify into a global movement. So um, as you're talking with your, your own club boards and uh, thinking about the things that you're doing, particularly as President-elect uh, Shaker has put such a strong emphasis on service projects, um, the environment might, might be one area that you would like to place some additional focus on. So as I transit into uh, putting this back into Gita's hands, let me take the opportunity to say thank you. A profound thank you to each and every one of you for your leadership, for what it is that you're going to do as Rotary Club president in this upcoming year. It will be one of the most incredible years of your life, albeit perhaps a little different, um, but it's your cho uh, choice and chance to be able to take an assembly of people and move them under a united vision into how you want your club to look like in the next uh, 17, 16, 17 months. So congratulations and let's have a little bit of dialogue. What a phenomenal inspirational speech, Jennifer. I'm already getting lots of compliments about how warm and welcoming your talk is. Well, thank you, I appreciate that. So all of the attendees, please put your questions in the Q&A section and not in the chat room. It will be really easier for us to track your questions. The, the DGEs though, I'm asking them first. The first person to ask you a question will be one of our DGEs, Debbie Wall. And she is hey, the district governor elect for District 7600. Hi, Debbie. Good morning, Jennifer. How so, are you? I'm good, how are you? Good, thank you. Thanks for being with us. Great thank to have you. you. So we will take one of our first questions out of the Q&A. And it's a question from John McEvoy. It says, for our older clubs, is it possible for Rotary to create a social media how-to guide so that our members losing their fear of social media and make it simple to use. So I, I need to just, you, you broke up a little bit on me. So a, a special guide on social media for older members, is that so what I heard? How, exactly, how do you, how, a how-to guide for older members to become easy and feel comfortable with using social media? Sure, that's a really good question. And thanks, John, for, for, for asking that. Interestingly enough, um, the research bears that the largest growing audience um, in social media, particularly uh, Facebook, is actually um, over the age of 65, which um, I think we can all um, say that the older we get, the younger that looks. Um, and so <laughs> I, I don't know that. I, I Let me give you my, my commentary on what I think of age. Um, we talk a lot about attracting younger members into our clubs. And, um, and that's good because of course, we need younger members. We need um, to ensure the, the, the legacy of our organization and the longevity of our organization. That's a given, that's an obvious, an obvious fact. However, I think that we need to be better in how we capture, um, how we say and how we frame this. I believe that we should be looking for members in our organization who are young thinkers. Have you met a 25-year-old who's old? 
Have you met an 86 year old who's young? It's about the way that we think, the open mindedness that we have. And I think that people who are open minded and young thinkers jump into things like social media, um, hopefully without a, you know, a little bit less fear. That being said, um, I know that technology doesn't always work. Let me give you an example in real time. I had in my entire set of remarks prepared um, for a teleprompter this morning that's sitting right in front of me. And in the seconds and minutes leading up to this talk, my technology went sideways and it, 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 would, not, it would not present in a, uh, it, it's supposed to, anyway, long story short, it wouldn't work. And so I was mentally doing the gymnastics on, okay, what were, what were in my remarks. We have to think sometimes fast. Technology is, is, is always morphing, is always changing, and sometimes unreliable. Um, but the, the point being there is that um, we all have to be sort of adaptable and nimble when it comes to technology. And a how-to guide, I think, is probably something that's wise for um, not only older members, but perhaps uh, members of all ages, because there's always a morphing... Um, social media is not something that is stagnant. It is something ever evolving. And so, you know, once we know that, um, I, I, I've heard this many times, you know, I'm, I'm on Facebook and on Twitter. Well, you know, the, the younger generation is like, well, if you, that's where you guys are, then I'm already on to Instagram and other, other different apps and different ways of, of connecting. But we all do need a little bit of special help. Now, let me just say this, instead of a manual that, um, that you could use for, um, uh, for improving your skills. Let me challenge you otherwise. This is an incredible opportunity for what I like to call cross mentorship, reaching out to whether it's your interactors or your rotor actors in your own area, um, where we often think of mentorship in this kind of um, hierarchy, where here's the mentor and here's the mentee. And we would say Rotary Club members here, rotor actors here. Uh, I like to think that we should be a little bit more like this in a cross mentorship mode where we have so much to learn from each other. And they are digital natives. They have been digital natives their entire life, lives. They understand all of the technology that we use far better than anyone else. And so this opportunity to learn from each other, I would engage, um, if you don't already have rotor actors that are part of your um, club experience, reach out and find the, 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 the closest one to you, or better yet, if there's not one nearby, start one. It's one of the most incredible growing movements within our organization right now. And the ability for us to, like I say, learn from each other is really profound. Thank you, Jennifer. The next question will be asked by Hugh Dawkins, District Governor-Elect, District 7630. Good morning, Jennifer. It's delightful, delightful to have you with us today. I'd like to, I don't want to touch on, on your thoughts for your theme, but I'd like you to talk a little bit, if you could, about some of the things that you would like to see specifically president-elects try to incorporate in their year this coming year? Where, okay. So thanks, Hugh. I appreciate that very much. And, uh, and you're right. I can't let the cat out of the bag on what, uh, what the theme will be for 22, but we do know what the theme is for the upcoming year. And uh, President, Sh president Elect Shaker has given us a very clear roadmap of the different things uh, that he would like to make sure that we place emphasis on. I know that he's going to spend more time on this, so I'll, I'll be brief in, in sort of outlining it, but he is very much of the thinking that we've been sitting at 1.2 million members for far too long and that we need to move the needle um, to 1.3 million. And so, uh, as I talked about earlier about this backdoor problem that we have, I think that you know a large part of helping to get to 1.3 million is not necessarily bringing people in, it's keeping the ones that we have. And so I think that that's something that we need to spend time as, as club presidents really focusing on, making sure that the engagement of our members is at an all-time high and that we're providing value for membership. Because when people feel valued and heard and have something meaningful and tangible to contribute, they're going to stay. So that's a number one charge that I would, I would add on to, to what he's also going to, to share with you. He's also challenging us to make sure that we're doing hands-on service. 
that's something that I feel very strongly about. That's continuity of leadership between he and I. I'm going to talk a lot about hands-on leadership as well. Um, he's also placing a very strong emphasis on raising up and empowering girls and women. And that may be something that for some of us, we think of as uh, something that needs to happen in another part of the world. But let me be candid and frank, it's something that needs to happen in every part of the world. And so um, there's opportunities for us to make sure that, uh, that we're taking the, 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 the things that he has placed in front of us and how we can make that meaningfully integrated into our clubs. Um, I don't want to spend more time talking about what he's going to already share with you. So that's a, that's a little bit of, of um, I know what he's going to talk about. So let me leave it at that and just say yeah, that thank you. continuity thank of living. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Thank Patricia, you. Patricia Borowski, District Governor Elect 7610, will ask you the next question. Uh, good morning, and thank you so much for being with us. Hi, Patricia. Um, <clears throat> I know that at Rotary, we've talked about trying to flatten the organization because the traditional model has been it takes so long from being a club president to have any really engagement at the RI level. Um, can you talk about the use of more task force oriented groups at RI that would be more inclusive of Rotarians um, because of their background and their experience versus just per se their position? Thank you. Thank you. No, it's a really meaningful question and one that um, one that I think is is very important because we, and we've actually taken some pretty strong steps toward uh, how to improve in this kind of territory. It shouldn't take three decades for, for someone to be a club president, to be the president of Rotary International. We, we shouldn't have to have that kind of um, length of, of service um, to, to reach the highest levels of our organization. It needs to be more attainable. Um, and skill-based um, assessment is certainly one of the ways, as you indicated, that um, that, that is, you know, a, a good moniker of, of, of where we can look. Uh, a task force was actually formed about five years ago, four years ago, I should say, um, called the Young Past District Governor um, Committee. And this committee was charged with doing exactly what you're saying, looking around the landscape at where we could be better at um, incorporating the thoughts of younger thinkers into all of our standing committees um, so that there's a voice at the table. And this committee also had a representative uh, from their committee at each one of the RI board meetings to make sure that they were providing the voice of those um, who might be a little bit younger than the assembly of people sitting at the, at the board table. It's been a very um, incredible experience and it's been something that has really elevated, I think the, the, the eye line on the importance of having diversity of thought. And that's, again, you know, I, I already spoke about that. That's one of the most important things is that we need to listen to um, and hear from people who represent uh, all of the demographics in our organization in order to be strong. And so looking now, and, and I actually spent a good portion of yesterday actually talking with the chair of that committee, talking about the future of that committee and where, you know, where the victories have been and where we still need to do better. And uh, one of the really great takeaways is that two of the members of that committee are now, uh, have now been selected to sit on the RI board, uh, both as, uh, as um, director's nominee, um, Drew Kessler and uh, Lena Mirschkog uh, from Norway. And so this is, this is an incredible step forward that younger members are um, be being able to cultivate the, the necessary steps in leadership to be able to put forward uh, their names to be selected. And so um, I think we're starting to see some of the compression happening. Um, I'll, I'll be candid, you know, only at 54 can you be the kid on the board. Um, it's, it's uh, you know, kind of, kind of silly to think that way. But, um, you know, uh, I represent a younger demographic than we have seen, um, certainly not by a, la a large stretch, but, you know, it, it's, it's one of the I, I certainly am one of the younger presidents we've seen in, in recent history. So I think that we're, we're seeing that compression happening, but I think we can do better at it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jennifer, my question to you is, most of the time, women have to do 100% of everything to get to the top. Men can get there sometimes. This is demographic research. It's not my opinion. They can get there with 60% of the demands met. 
when you heard for your ideas, no, you can't do that, or that can't be done, how did you approach it? Hmm, that's a good question. Let me, let me share with you very quickly a, a story from a few years ago when Oprah Winfrey was still um, broadcasting her show live. I attended one of her, her uh, programs. And on the show that day was uh, Gloria Steinem, um, the mother of feminism, as we all know. And um, I won't give you the whole landscape of what the show was about, but she made this statement. It was incredibly profound. And out of the mouth of the mother of feminism, she said, we got it wrong. And she said, only when the pendulum swings to the center and men and women um, are able to be in true um, uh, equal nurturers um, will we have true equality. And I was, I was blown away to, to be in that moment hearing her so many years later say that, you know, equal nurturing was going to be the, the, the barometer of, of true equality. And I think that, you know, we've seen so much movement toward, uh, toward that you know, the, the, the point that you just made about being told no, um, I don't know that that's necessarily a, a male or a female thing. We've all had to come up against walls and, and um, how you surmount those walls is, 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 always, is always challenging regardless, regardless of gender. Uh, I think for, for women, uh, and I don't wanna do a, a deep dive on this, um, you know, we, we do need to get closer to that equal nurturing part. Uh, I think for a lot of women, uh, there's a, a bit more of a balancing act, um, perhaps between our vocational lives, our raising a family, um, preparing meals, getting Christmas presents, doing the, the sending of flowers, you know, all the different things that we just do sort of, and that's not to say that men don't do that. I don't want to go down that, that path because I have a, a, a lot of uh, friends who are incredibly balanced in, in all of that different, all those different kinds of things. But I think sometimes for women, it is a bit more of a challenge because we are juggling a lot of different, a lot of different things. Um, but the no part, it's tenacity, it's perseverance. It's not taking uh, no for an answer. And this is a, a very quick example. I had a, an email recently from a woman in, uh, in one of the African countries, I won't point out specifically because I don't want to identify her, but she said, you know, she had asked if I would write an article for their, their magazine, their regional magazine, and I quite candidly bandwidth wise just don't have the, the, the capacity at this moment to be able to do it. And so the answer was given back to her that unfortunately I wasn't going to be able to participate in, in doing that. And so she wrote me a personal note and she said, you know, as a woman, she said, I've, under, I've understood that, you know, we can't always take no for an answer. And I'm coming back to you to say, can you please reconsider doing this? And I'm sorry if I'm being, you know, strong, but I believe that, you know, I need to, I need to be able to say one more time, will you do it? I so respected the perseverance out of her that I wrote her back within seconds. And I said, absolutely, let's game on, let's do it. We found a different way to do it. We're going to do it as an interview live. And so I don't have to sit for two hours to write the article. We can compress it into a 20 minute interview that she can take um, some excerpts out of. So it's a win-win for both of us. But she wrote back, she said, you have no idea how happy I am. I just had to pour myself a glass of wine so I could sit here and read this email one more time. And I thought, <laughs> okay, that's what we've got to do. We've got to be, you know, we've all got to support each other and, and, and make sure that we're all doing the right things and, and helping to prop each other up. And I really respected that she took the second chance at it. Okay, I'm trying to be mindful of the time and people in the audience have asked questions. How are clubs changing from the prayer or invocation either to include all religions or to remove God as the focus to inspiration? This is a, a very timely question, obviously, as it ties into um, the, the topic of diversity, equity, and inclusion, which I've addressed already. And, you know, I, I've traveled to clubs all over um, the world, and I'm going to use the United States as an example because it will be most relevant. You know, in some parts of, of the United States, I've been in clubs where um, it is very um, Christian focused and very God based and there, there is an invocation and that is that is what is part of their culture. I've been in other areas of, um, you know, the United States where it is an inspiration that, you know, religion has been taken completely out of it. I think the best advice that I can give to you is that we need to, again, take that survey 
um, of our communities to make sure that it is representative of, um, of our community and that it crosses, um, it, that, that it's something that is representative and meaningful to all. And I think if we use the four-way test, um, that is one, one of our barometers of whether it's fair to all concerned. I think that that's a good way for us to be able to look at it. Um, and I think also we need to look at it through the lens of the fact that we are a non-religious, non-political organization. Now in saying that, I'm not trying to tell you what you, know, you should do in your club. Uh, if you've got traditions and things that are important to you, that's, that's one thing. But I think if you can look at it through the lens of the things that I've just said, perhaps it might give you better opportunity to see diversity and whether or not it applies fairly to all concerned. Thank you. Jennifer, there are two questions about diversity. One is one of our audience members wants to know if there is going to be a manual that's going to be put out about diversity inclusion. And then the second question is that the, this, this person's club avoids politics, but how do we deal with the politics surrounding diversity, equity, and inclusion? The politics are very divisive now. Yes. Um, so first and foremost, with regard to whether there'll be a, a manual or a policy book, I don't know that it's going to be necessarily a manual or policy book, but there will be tools um, that the diversity, equity, and inclusion task force is working on. And they've yet to construct them, so I'm not sure um, exactly what to tell you what they're going to be, but there are going to be tools that will be um, disseminated to, to, to the club level um, to help and assist in, in doing that. The, to the latter part of the question, it's a challenging one, and particularly through the landscape in, in North America, and in particular the United States right now, it is a very divisive issue, and um, it's a very politically charged issue. Um, and and the, the part of that, um, you know, when we think of diversity, equity, and inclusion, it's a very broad, that's very broad. Um, the, the topic of race is probably the one that when we talk about it having more of the political edges, I think that that's probably the one right now that is most pervasive and the one that is most challenging to have. Um, as I said, I, I believe that as an organization that values diversity and that, um, that we are non-political and non-religious, it does give us a unique opportunity to perhaps be part of the, 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 the dialogue to help heal because I think that right now that's a big part of what needs to happen. Um, and that's not a political statement. That is just a human statement that we need to, to heal um, the divide that is, that is going on and to perhaps bring a bit more calm and level-headed conversation um, into the mix. And so I, I do think that, that Rotary Clubs have an ability to have that kind of dialogue and it's not an easy one. It's, that is not an easy lift. It is, it is a very, very difficult lift. Um, and there are people who are very specialized in being able to lead these kinds of conversations. And um, perhaps, you know, I know that a number of different districts around um, North America um, and the world, quite candidly, um, a number of districts have actually been having workshops on, you know, these kinds of topics and how to have the, the conversations. How do you sit next to somebody in your Rotary Club at a point in time where we are politically divided and and still respect your friendship with each other when you have such different beliefs. And um, social media has been a very big player in all of that. We've seen a lot of people who've unfriended people who've decided that, you know, if you think that way, I don't want to be your friend anymore. That's not, that's not what Rotary is all about. This is a place where we get to be together in safe space and work together towards things that unite us. And so the more we can do to create that kind of harmony um, and, I think, that, I think that we're at a unique time in history, you as club presidents, to help with that kind of dialogue. And um, the, so, tools, the tools that you need are, are being devised as we speak. Thank you so much, Jennifer. There are a lot of, there are many more questions, but unfortunately we do not have time to continue to talk about them. The, there are, there's a request for this recording, so the recording will be made available to you all. And hopefully we will have other occasions when you all will meet Jennifer in person and ask your questions in a house of friendship, maybe in Houston. What an inspirational talk and so many comments here about what a wonderful way this was to start the day. Thank you.
and we welcome you back to our districts again whenever possible. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Gita, and have a great day, everyone, and thank you for your leadership. Bye-bye.